Welcome to Glendale First United Methodist Church. I'm Reverend Chris Tate, and I'm so happy that you've joined us for worship today. And we are gathering here as what is uh, an ever exciting season here in the life of the church, that which is Lent, these 40 days that lead us up to the celebration of Easter. And so with that, we have a number of great opportunities coming up to help us to not only celebrate the joy that is the resurrection, but also to help us to appreciate the events that lead up to that. And so we have worship today and then a week from today on April 2nd, we will be having Palm Sunday and which will begin Holy Week for us. On that Thursday, we will have a Holy Thursday service. On Friday, we will have a Good Friday service. Both of those will be here in the sanctuary at 6.30 p.m. And then of course, on the 9th, we'll be having our Easter celebration. We'll also be having an Easter egg hunt, so you'll wanna check that out. It is for kids, of course. Um, and so those are great ways to do that. Not only that, we also have today, if you're watching this today on the 26th, we're having our monthly fellowship lunch today. And so if you're in the area and watching this, we'd love to have you come and join us for that. It will be immediately after the second worship service. So it'll be roughly about 1140 or so that we'll start getting uh, going with that. And so if you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us for some food and fellowship as well. And so with all of that said, and as we begin to worship today, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the amazing love that you have for us and help us to be able to remember that in receiving that love, that it is not just for us, but that it is for all your people as well. And so that for us to receive your love is to respond and to respond in kind by loving you with all that we are and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Help us to be able to receive that message in this worship service today so that we can be transformed by your love. It is in the mighty name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Our gospel reading for today is from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we are almost to the end of our Lenten journey. We are almost to the end of this 40 day season where we have been following along with Jesus as he makes his way towards Jerusalem, towards the cross, towards the crucifixion and towards the joy of the resurrection. And in that we've been looking more pointedly at what it means for us to be his followers, specifically what it looks like for us uh, to live and think and believe and value in such a way so that it helps us to be more like him, because a foundational part of what this season is about is sort of waking from our slumber, getting away from all those things that, that constantly distract us and reprioritizing what it means to, to tangibly, to actually be a follower of Jesus Christ and to do that in our lives. And so we've been going throughout the season, looking at the gospel according to John and how John reveals Jesus to us. And so we are coming to uh, almost to the end of the story, as John tells us, and our particular scripture for today that Pastor Stephanie just read for us, comes to us immediately before Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem on what we know as Palm Sunday and for that great celebration. And what happens in this moment is, is incredibly poignant. It's a beautiful and heartfelt story, but also it gives us a great insight into what is to unfold. As we've talked about uh, in the past couple of weeks, that, that there have been a number of differences that occur between the different gospel accounts, between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to tell the story in one way and that John approaches it from a different angle. Uh, I've mentioned this before, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what it is that ultimately causes the religious leaders of the day to decide that Jesus has to die comes on Palm Sunday. So in their telling of the story, it hasn't happened yet. 
It's when Jesus cleanses the temple and drives out the money changers and those who sell dove, when he upends that that economic system, um, which we'll talk about next week on Palm Sunday. But for John, it's something different. For John, it's the raising of Lazarus from the dead. When the religious leaders of that day see how powerful Jesus is and they see how incredibly moving it is, what it is that he's able to do and how it speaks to people and reaches people. I mean, imagine if we saw someone who could literally bring people back to life after they died, how likely would we be to want to be a part of what they're doing? I think the chances are pretty good. The religious leaders of the day were no different, and they, they believed that, that if people saw this, if word got out about what Jesus could do, then, then why would they need them? Why would they be a part of what they had been a part of and had helped to create and shepherd for these hundreds, if not thousands of years? Why wouldn't they just flee everything and go follow Jesus? And so because of that, they were afraid, and their fear manifested itself in anger and in hatred and ultimately in violence. And so because of the raising of Lazarus from the dead, they decided that Jesus was going to have to die. And they just hadn't got to that point yet. And so where our scripture picks up today is in that that brief period in between from when Lazarus was raised from the dead and right before that Jesus was betrayed and is ultimately crucified. At this point in the story, it says that that he is there, that Jesus is gathered with his disciples, with those closest to him, with the women who were there with them through thick and thin, and Lazarus was also there with them. That Lazarus was reclining with Jesus, that they were gathered around this table, and how happy and excited everybody must have been. It says that Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sisters, were there as well. And think for a moment how they must have felt. If you remember back to the scripture where we talked about the raising of Lazarus, how absolutely devastated they were that their brother had died. And not just that, but feeling like Jesus had abandoned them by not being there for them in their time in need. And yet when he does show up four days after Lazarus dies, that Jesus brings him back to life. And how truly excited and just overwhelmed they were. We fast forward and it seems like that that feeling has not changed, which is understandable because this would have only been a very short period of time later after that would have happened. And that in all of her joy and all of her gratitude and appreciation for what Jesus did, we have Mary being one of the key figures in the story. As the scripture unfolds, it says that that Mary comes forward and that she anoints Jesus's feet. Now, we need to understand a little bit about what's happening in in this story for it to make sense. Because it says that they're reclining, that they're eating, and that Mary does this while they're eating. And I don't think it really makes sense for us in in our modern Western understanding. We think, did she crawl under the table? What's she doing? How did people not know what was happening? In that day and age, the way that people would eat um, most of their meals, especially sort of, you know, gathering celebration meals like this, you know, like a large, not like you're just eating your lunch by yourself, but a large meal together, um, it would often happen around uh, what would be called um, a triclinium. And so you would have a table and then you would have tables that would go out around it. So it would sort of make a U shape. And they didn't have chairs that we would often think of. Instead, they would have cushions. And so these tables would only be a little bit off the ground, maybe a foot, maybe 18 inches or so. And then the people who were eating would be laying. They'd be laying on their sides and they would have their left hand because their left hand was unclean in that culture and that understanding. And they would be sort of leaning on their arm or resting on their arm while they would eat with the right hand. And because of that, it would be open in the center so the servants, the people who were bringing the food, would be able to place them, to take the the plates away, to be able to bring uh, the new food and the other courses and all those things going on. And so if you imagine that sort of setup, if you're sitting that way, your feet would be extended away from the table and your focus would be on uh, what you were eating, on talking to the people to your left and right, to the, the, all the activity that was going on with the servants bringing the food. And you wouldn't really be paying attention to what's going on behind you. It's into that moment and into that particular space that Mary comes. And it says she comes and she anoints Jesus's feet. 
That also can sound bizarre to us. We don't really anoint each other's feet. Uh, it's not something uh, we do. You may think of getting a pedicure, but that's not really the same thing. In that day and age, um, people walked virtually everywhere. I mean, few people would have a beast of burden that they would ride on, or even if you're wealthy, maybe a chariot or something of that nature, but almost everybody walked. And when you did, you would have usually sandals of something of that nature where your feet would be exposed, where you would rock, walk with the rocks and the dust and the dirt. And so your feet would get horribly beaten up and bruised and all the things that would come with that. And so caring for someone's feet was a great sign of respect, of admiration. It was something that you did for someone because you cared greatly for them, or it was something that was left to really the lowliest of the slaves. In a really fascinating way, we see what Mary doing here for Jesus and anointing his feet, which the word can also be translated as washing, and doing this for him here, Jesus also is going to do this again for his disciples on the night of the Last Supper immediately before his crucifixion. But again, that's a story for Holy Thursday. And so as this is happening, she brings out what is called nard, which is a funny word, but it is an ointment that was made from a particular flower. Spiked nard is what it's called, and it was something that had to be imported. I've come to learn over the years that it's only grown in the Himalayas. It usually grows between 9,000 and 16,000 feet. And because of that, and because the, the flowers are small and they don't produce a lot of fragrance, that it takes a lot of them to be able to make any sort of, of ointment or anything of that nature. And so because of it, what she is doing, um, this substance that she's using is incredibly expensive. It's incredibly valuable. And so in doing this in anointing his feet and using her hair, which letting your hair down in public as a Jewish woman was absolutely not okay. But in doing this, she's showing how much she loved Christ, how grateful she was to him for what he did, for what he had done for her brother, for how he had brought him back to life, for the amazing transformation that she had seen him make in her own life, just because of the love that she had for him. Now, I think if we were just to look at that, we would see that and think, isn't that a beautiful story? Isn't it great to see someone who so deeply loved Jesus that responded in such a profound and extravagant and such a generous way, being willing to give him such an amazing gift and do it in such a personal and intimate and touching way? Isn't that just a beautiful thing? But that's not where the story stops. We have another person who comes into the story, and it is Jesus. And, and in this, John, as John often does, gives us all these parenthetical statements to, to be a narrator to tell us what's going on. And in case we didn't know, uh, Judas is not the person of the high standards. Judas is someone who ultimately ends up betraying Jesus. He sells him out. He betrays him uh, for 30 pieces of silver. And it says when Judas sees this, that he's furious. And he's not furious because Mary's let down her hair. He's not furious because, you know, Mary's doing these things and it's seen as inappropriate or anything like that. He's doing it because he thinks it's a waste of money. He thinks it's a waste of money that Mary is spending, wasting so much money on this extravagant uh, sign and ritual, this act towards Jesus, when this money could go instead for the poor. Now, again, John tells us here that, that Judas doesn't care about the poor. That's not what motivates him, but he stole, that he was the treasurer, if you will, for the disciples. And he liked to take from that shared purse. He liked to take from that money and use it for himself. We don't know what for, but we know that he stole it and he did. And so he's, he's jealous, he's upset, he's angry because she's taking this money and using it towards Christ when he instead wants to keep it for himself. And in response to this, we see his anger, we see his frustration, we see Jesus coming back and speaking to him. But in all of this, I think we most profoundly see something that speaks to who we are as human beings. And whether we were people who were there with Jesus in this moment, whether we are his followers some 2,000 years later, the truth about it is never as much the same as it is now, as it was then, as it will always be. So I think the, the message that it's trying to help us to understand here, the message that John's trying to help us to appreciate in this interaction, 
is when we try to make sense of, of what is appropriate and how we respond to Jesus. What's too much and what's not enough? I think what we see in Mary is we see someone whose life was utterly changed and transformed because of the way that Jesus interacted with Mary, interacted with her like, like a disciple, the way that Jesus healed and brought her brother back from the dead. I mean, how transformative would that be for you? Would that be for me to have someone we loved and cared about so dearly die, die in front of us and then to have them brought back? How grateful we would be. And because she has experienced so much change in her life, she truly loves Jesus in ways that are beyond reason, that are beyond rational thought. She could have done that and shown a sign of appreciation where it didn't cost 300 denarii, which denarii is a, doll, a day's wage. If you do a day of hard labor, you would get one denarii in return, where instead of doing it for 300, she could have done it for maybe 20 or 10. I don't know what the prices were back then, but I'm sure she could have gotten something more affordable. But for someone who had been so deeply touched by Christ, whose life had been so utterly transformed in the best possible way, I would imagine even for her in spending that much on this gift and doing such a personal and intimate act to show her gratitude, I wouldn't be surprised if we were able to ask Mary now that she wouldn't say that she didn't even feel like that was enough. And yet on the other hand, we have Judas who, for whatever reason, didn't have that same relationship with Christ. He was one of the 12 disciples and who had been with him for all of those three years of his public ministry, who had seen the miracles, who had seen him raise people from the dead, who had seen him calm the storms and walk on water and feed the multitudes and all of these things. And yet Judas was the one who was willing to sell him out to the authorities for 30 pieces of silver. Judas didn't understand Mary and Mary didn't understand Jesus. And I'm sure she didn't when she found out what happened after the fact. But what's fascinating in this is that even with Judas being exposed to these things, instead what he's focusing on is completely something else. He's not seeing the powerful work of Christ that's happening. He's not seeing the healing and the restoration and all of these things. But instead what he's focusing on is that how much money is being spent and how that money could have been used for other things. And as we hear in the comments, that that money would have been better used by going to him, for it being available for him to steal it and use it for himself. I think that's a powerful lesson for all of us, that all of us have the ability and the opportunity to, to have an awareness or to have an understanding, to have an experience in, in seeing Christ's work at the world, to be a part of that, to take part in those efforts and to see the life change that can happen because of it. But yet knowing even in response to that, that we won't all see it the same way. That there's the potential and the opportunity to see it as something transformative that can make us phenomenally different and better people who love God with all that we are and love others as we love ourselves. Or we can be like Judas who see these things and instead of seeing it for the transformative power that it is, instead we see what it costs us. We see what we could gain from it if things were done differently. That if things weren't done to benefit Christ and to do his teachings, how much of that could be used for us instead? Hopefully what you've been able to see as we've gone on this Lenten journey is that foundationally what it means for us to be followers of Christ means that it can't just be all about us. That foundationally what it means to be a Christian is that great commandment, which is not love yourself with all that you can, and it's not even love others as you love yourself. It's love God with all that you are and love others as you love yourself. Or even as some say, love God with all that you are. And we do that by loving others as we love ourselves. Foundationally, what is at the heart of the Christian faith is being like Christ. And what we see in being like Christ is that fundamental love of others. 
And that when we see that, when we celebrate that, when we see what Christ has done in our own life and the transformation that has taken place, that it changes us. It makes us different people. It makes us people who have that desire at our best moments to want to be engaged in those extravagant acts for others. But yet we don't have to be that we have a choice in that and can instead interpret that only as something that costs us and what we will lose in the process. It's my hope, it's my prayer that for you, for me, for all of us, that especially as we approach the celebration on Easter Sunday, that we can not only remember the sacrifice, but we can also recognize and celebrate the new life that Christ came and that Christ offers to all of us. And that to be a part of that means loving God with all that we are and loving others as we love ourselves. And that in being that way, that is not foundationally self-focused, can not only change us, but that it can change the world as well. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the amazing love that you have for us. And that even though that you had the power to do anything that you wanted, and could have used it to give yourself a life of ease and pleasure and decadence and all of those things, that instead you used all of that to heal, to restore, to fight injustice and oppression, and to help bring about reconciliation in ways that we can still even to this day not even fully comprehend. Help us to be able to fully appreciate who you are and to be willing to follow in your footsteps, to be willing to let some of ourselves go so that we can more fully take hold of you. And that in doing so, we can help be your disciples, that we can help be your agents who are active in this world to help share your love in every place that it's needed. And as we pray these things, we also pray together saying, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When we gather together to worship, we remember we do so not as audience and performers. We come as those who offer their shared worship and praise to the living God. One of the ways in which we do this is by generously giving a portion of what has been given to us. And in doing so, seeking to embrace the generosity Jesus Christ modeled perfectly in all that he was and is. One of the ways that you can worship through generously giving here at Glendale First is by going to glendalefirst.org to give online. As we do this, we remember that our lives overflow with the goodness of God, sharing what we have so abundantly received We bring now our tithes and offerings to God with gladness and gratitude. Let us pray. In gratitude, O God, we come to your table, into your presence, into your house, for all that you have done for us, most especially for bringing us into the light of Jesus Christ. We offer our thanks and praise. We long to live as children of light, doing what is pleasing to you and bearing the fruit of the light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So before we have our benediction, don't forget that if you're watching this on today, March 26th, we're having our fellowship luncheon today at about 1140, 1145 in the Carlson. So we'd love to have you join us if you're in the area. Also coming up on the second is Palm Sunday. And then that begins Holy Week for us, where on Thursday and Friday, we'll have special services here in the sanctuary. Both of those will be in person and at 630. And then of course, on Easter on the ninth, we will have that great celebration. And also we'll be having an Easter egg hunt as well for kids. So if you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us. And as we go forth from this place and you go back to your life and whatever waits for you there, remember the amazing love that God has for you and that to receive that means to respond in kind by being willing to give of ourselves just like Christ did. And in doing that, we not only change ourselves, but we also change the world. In the name of God, the creator, sustainer, and redeemer. Amen.